All right, everybody. This is uh, welcome to Papers We Love. Uh, we're going to to um, have a, an announcement from Yammer, our host. So thank you very much to Yammer for hosting us again. Applause. Can we do an applause? Woo! Hi, welcome. Glad, glad everybody could join us. Glad we could be hosting this event. Um, yes, we're hiring. Everybody is, but um, we've got a little bit of details on the side monitors in terms of uh, what we do, why we do it, what we're looking for, the tools we use, the challenges we have. Um, but we just hope you enjoy the presentations tonight. Thanks. Thank you. All right. So we're going to have two presentations today. Uh, uh, a little bit of administrivia. Next month is going to be uh, Lindsay Cooper talking about ribbon proofs for separation logic. So that should be really nice. And uh, that's our main talk. And for this one, we have Nathan. And uh, apparently, I'm going to step up my game and start reading the, the bioses that I ask the speakers to provide. So, so I'm going to be like reading to this thing, and uh, there may be facts that are not real, but I'm going to leave that to the listener's uh, interpretation. So Nathan is currently working on low latency content distribution at Fastly. He works with me, and has previously hacked on improving the performance of language runtimes and OS hypervisors. He may or may not have killed a man in Reno. Uh, his first exposure to OS, to OS research came as a graduate student at the University of British, uh, British Columbia. Yes, so let's give it up for Nathan. All right. Hey, everybody. Um, thanks for, so much for coming to the pre-show. It's great to see so many people here. Uh, so yeah, thanks, Inez, for that mostly accurate introduction. Uh, so yeah, my name is Nathan Taylor. Uh, I'm a programmer here in San Francisco. Um, and I'd like to talk to you about a paper that I really liked that I discovered when I was in grad school called Your Computer is Already a Distributed System. Why isn't your, why isn't your OS? Uh, this is a short workshop paper that was published at Hot OS, which is, uh, stands for Hot Topics in Operating Systems in 2009. Um, and I should say that they have a follow-up paper uh, with more performance data um, called the Multikernel, and a new OS Architecture for Scalable Multicore Systems, published at SOSP, which is one of the big uh, systems conferences the same year. Um, so if you're interested in this work, you should probably read both, uh, and I'll have a few slides that were taken from this, uh, this paper as well. All right, so hot OS papers are generally known for their punchy titles and bold claims. Um, and I think right off the bat, it's worth investigating the claim that the paper makes in its title. So in what way is our computer already a distributed system, and in what way is our OS not like a distributed system? So this is the mental model that I think a lot of us have of computers. So there's memory, there's stable storage, you know, hard drive, hopefully SSD because it's 2015, uh, maybe a network card, and there's a whole bunch of wires connecting all those things together uh, to the CPU up top, sure. So you know, if you're reading an array, you go and read the zeroth element from memory, and then you read the, second, or the first element from memory, and then the second. Um, but look, this isn't how computers work. Uh, this isn't how your 386 worked. Uh, this is barely how your Apple II worked. Uh, not just because there's a network card and a hard drive. Um, so those CPU cores, they actually contain memory caches of recently accessed memory. And sometimes those caches are shared between cores, so they're not totally independent from one another. So remember that array that we thought we were reading from RAM? Well, the first read would be from main memory, because we hadn't read anything close to it before. Uh, but then subsequent elements will be bulk copied into one of these caches, so uh, faster accesses will happen under our noses. And the reason why this is is faster is because these caches are just physically closer to the CPU core and electrons are slow. So as for RAM, so yes, a CP given CPU is connected to main memory, but only to a subset of it. So in this example here, you know, there's two sticks of RAM that might be connected to these cores, but there are some other grayed out ones that aren't plugged in directly. So what this means is you have the story that I just drew replicated a whole bunch of times in an internal network with some sort of possibly non-uniform topology. So any peripheral devices you have, like network card or graphics card, will hang off one of these nodes. So what this means is that a CPU may have to traverse this network in order to read and write memory. And performance with peripherals like a network card can, can vary wildly depending on which core your program's running on. So if you're plugged into this one here, for instance, you'll have a lot better access to uh, the network card than if you were on some distant one. Um, as we all know, we have a consistent view of memory no matter what, at least on x86. Um, and this has to be maintained by a distributed consensus protocol. So this is already feeling a lot like work we've seen 
in, you know, when you're writing software for, you know, a data center. So here's a figure from the paper that points out uh, the difference in time that it takes to read memory from the closest cache to a given processor and memory requiring two network hops away uh, from the CPU in question. And as you can see, it, it differs by a factor of almost 150. So this is really something that we have to keep in mind when we're writing large concurrent software. So here's another thing that I want to point out just to underscore my punchline, although it's not directly relevant to the paper. Um, the hardware can detect when an individual processor is failing and offline that node. And a similar process allows for hot pluggable devices to be inserted and have the topology dynamically change. So if I just plugged in, for instance, an SSL accelerator card, which is something that uh, companies like Intel are starting to produce, um, dynamically the, the distributed system can self-adjust to compensate for it. So here's the point I'm trying to make. If you're a distributed systems practitioner, you may know of these. These are the fallacies of distributed computing. I first learned of these from my friend Jeff, who's in the front row. He's, he gave the big thumbs up as soon as he saw it, so he's happy about this at least. And I think a nice way of summarizing the point that the author is trying to make is that possibly with the exception of number four, because we don't really care about security so much right now, these apply at least, at least as much within an individual modern server as it does across a data center. So as a result, as the number of cores increase on our machines, because this is the way that we have computers come, become faster these days, the performance hit from conceptualizing what's happening in our machines as the not even a 386 model that I sent, I had a couple slides ago, um, becomes increasingly dire. So to that end, um, in this paper, the research operating systems that the authors built um, is called Barrelfish. Um, and they have a cute logo, so that's cool. And what they've done is, rather than structuring the kernel the way operating systems like Linux and Windows is, by and large, where there's one kernel process, you know, one kernel program that runs on all CPUs concurrently, and where by default all kernel data structures and code are shared between CPUs. And you know, if there's uh, shared data structures that ha you have to reason about concurrently, you have locks to, to avoid concurrency bugs. They have independent, let's call them for the moment, mini kernels. Uh, they call them operating system nodes, running in isolation on each core. Um, it's the stuff in the dotted lines. Um, in the OS research community, this sort of disaggregated kernel goes by many names, uh, but microkernel tends to be the most frequently used terms. That has certain implications that we'll talk about in a little bit, but generally, microkernel is kind of what we're talking about. Um, notice that each node can be tailored to its underlying hardware uh, based on the kind of core that's running on. So, you know, if you have in the future um, a system with heterogeneous CPUs, so for instance, an x86 um, itanium for some reason because we're in a Back to the Future Part 2, Darkest Timeline Universe, as well as ARM, and then a general purpose graphics card, all needing the same operating system. You can scale out horizontally in this way, irrespective of how heterogeneous your system might be. Um, and also, you can make uh, certain changes depending on where it lives in that network topology that we had uh, a few slides back. And because the, any state that the OS needs to share is replicated across CPUs, it promotes a sharing should be made explicit philosophy which I think if we build large distributed systems, this is something that we already kind of understand and appreciate. Um, and as a result, as a result of having, uh, instead of having the cache coherence protocol, um, desperately try and keep up and maintain a consistent view of memory um, as you would have to do in the situation where we consider it all as if, as if it was an Apple II or a 386. Um, changes, replicated, sorry, changes in replicated shared state are performed higher up the stack. Uh, by OS nodes exchanging messages run, uh, with one another instead of just stomping over shared memory. Okay, so this is Groovy. Uh, they built the system, they benchmarked it. Um, won't talk too much about performance, but you know, they, it kind of sells their point. Um, the source is up on their Git repo, so you can check it out and play with it. Um, but there's only one small problem, and that's, from a research perspective, I haven't told you anything that hasn't already been published well before. Uh, the OS research community has been proposing Disaggregating the OS into components not dissimilar to the operating system node um, for longer than I would wager some of the people in this room have been alive. Um, and that's okay. Like, th that, that's not a fault of the paper. The, author the authors aren't pulling the wool over our eyes by doing this. In fact, a large part of the paper is discussing previous work in the microkernel space. Um, and their proposals are numerous and well understood by both the OS, and, uh, OS practitioner community and the research community as well. Here's a random walk that I did. Um, with related papers in the space until I ran out of space on the slide. Um, so you can be forgiven for wondering, like, what is it about this paper that I find so enticing? 
the thing that this paper does for me that the rest of the so-called alternative OS papers don't do so well is that this paper sells a great meta point that I think a lot of folks in the industry and researchers as well tend to overlook when they're pitching an idea, being it an idea you're pitching to a program community because you've written a research paper on it, or to your PhD advisor, or to your manager at whatever company you work at, or to a VC if you're a founder. So if we ignore the slightly what has been done will be done again, there's nothing new under the sun subtext to this question. I mean, let's face it, any great idea you have could well have been thought of before already. And conversely, why build that great system today when you can watch Netflix tonight and build it tomorrow maybe? Put it off for another day. So it's important, to, it's important not to forget to argue not only why the thing you want to build matters, but why now is the right moment to build it. So there's this person, Jochen Liebke, who was one of the early researchers into uh, the microkernel space. Uh, he wrote a retrospective for the ACM a number of years ago called Towards Real Microkernels. It should be up online if you, uh, if you want to find it. That summarizes pretty well the traditional arguments for why we want to use a new disaggregated, micro, uh, sorry, a new disaggregated uh, operating system instead of traditional, what's, what we call monolithic kernels. Um, there's, to summarize them briefly, microkernels are more flexible, they're more extensible, they provide better fault isolation guarantees because things sort of run in individual processes rather than having you know, just sort of one big blob together. Uh, security implications are easier to reason about because you have a smaller trusted computing base. So that's all cool. But that comes at a cost, right? Like, the no free lunch theorem is a real thing. Um, and the microkernel, broadly speaking, charges its tax in the form of performance. Um, so if I can read a little bit of this here. There were, there were arguments that high interprocess communication costs were an inherent, con inherent consequence of the structure of microkernel-based systems. So despite heroic efforts, frankly, on the part of the microkernel community to make these... Um, these IPC calls, which were analogous to method call or function calls, as fast uh, as they would be in a traditional OS. I mean, hands up if you're using a microkernel today. I'm expecting one hand. I got a, one hand coming up. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Paul. Uh, we should talk later. Um, but what the authors of this paper have done is they've flipped the traditional microkernel argument on its head. Remember, before that slide, I didn't say anything about other, anything other than performance of modern large systems. Like, we're not sacrificing performance for the traditional benefits of a disaggregated kernel anymore. By pivoting the argument to one that says, the only way to scale software in the age of computers with many dozens of cores on it is to adopt this style of operating system, we're left with the belief that we get the best of all possible worlds, all the arguments that have been made for decades about why we should be running microkernels, but as well as we get better performance than as if we did the thing that we're doing now. So, if you thought this was maybe interesting, if you want to hear a little bit more about operating system scalability, um, I would invite you to come back in December, uh, because I'll be talking nominally about uh, two papers. One is called Cori, an operating system for many cores, uh, that was published at OSD in 2008, uh, and, and as well as another one uh, coming at it from the other angle, uh, an analysis of Linux scalability to many, uh, to many cores, published by some of the same people. Um, I think this will be interesting. We'll talk about how operating systems look and how they should look, and the meaning of research, and why I don't have a PhD, maybe if there's time. And so it should be, it should be a good time. Um, so I'd like to leave you all with a few starter arguments for us to have later at the pub later tonight, because of course, arguing with one another at the pub is a core part of the papers we love experience. Um, so hopefully I've convinced you that at least a modern computer is an array of independent processors, just from the slides that I drew for you. Um, However, the underlying substrate, the network that carries messages between them to synchronize, uh, to synchronize memory, is not actually at all what you would expect to see in a data center or a wide array network. And in fact, it offers very many different guarantees. So what I mean by this is that here are some things that the authors don't discuss. Arbitrarily long message delays, message ordering, message duplication or loss, and the words partial failure do not actually exist in either of the papers. In fact, they don't have to discuss it because the underlying hardware protocol that, uh, that most x86, well, all x86 machines that most large servers run guarantees in order exactly once delivery, which is a great property for a distributed system to have, but in general, we don't get that if we're running in a data center environment. Um, also, bandwidth isn't infinite on like the network bus, but I think you have to work pretty hard to saturate that within a machine. Um, and all for the talk of cores being able to offline themselves whenever. Uh, the topology of the network doesn't really change as often as 
you know, a service-oriented micro microservice architecture if you're running like a web service like Twitter, for instance. Um, so if if this made you itchy, if you're saying I have strong opinions about this, um, please come find me and we'll uh, we'll duke it out over a beer tonight. Um, so that's about all I have. Um, thanks a lot. And if anyone has any questions, um, I'd be happy to try and answer them. Yes, Mr. Hodges. Oh, you're saving it for the pub. Okay. Oh, do you want to? Oh, yeah, sure. Okay. So have you put much thought into the, or read things that have put much thought into uh, bringing the IPC problem down to where Mezzi is? Because like part of the, part of the reason why Mezzi is working is because it's like embedded in the hardware yep. and it's super freaking fast. Right. And like repurposing that for IPC between these nodes may be possible. I don't know. I don't know how it works. Yep. Uh, so to summarize the question, like, how can we take advantage of the existing uh, um, consensus protocol that the hardware offers us? Uh, the authors talk a little bit about this in terms of the implementation in their follow-up papers. Um, they talk about how they use it to minimize the number of, uh, of round trips that they need to synchronize memory. Um, so there's that. In the future work section of, of this work, generally they always talk about, like, well, if the computer is a distributed system, and distributed systems are distributed systems. We, couldn't we have like one operating system in the data center? Like, couldn't we just extend this to like an arbitrarily complex number of machines? Um, so they're definitely thinking about it. Um, they're very honest in the paper, and they, they, the way they pitch is they say like, some people have proposed to us that you could do this, and we are skeptical. However, we're putting this in the paper just because maybe it's a good idea. So yeah, there's definitely kind of work in that space. Um, but that's like a big viper pit that many people have fallen into thinking that we're going to be able to have distributed shared memory across data centers. And then, yeah. Oh. Yeah. Uh, Mac OS is based on Mac, I think. And Mac was originally microkernel. Is it no longer, or is it... Is it all like this? Um, so the question was, Mach was, yeah, so I think OS 10 is based on Mach. Um, I don't know to what extent it still is now. The impression that I have is that enough changed. Is there anyone who, are there any Apple employees in the audience that might be able to, oh, there's someone. <laughs> you can't ask that. Sorry? You can't ask that. I can't, oh. Uh, <laughs> the, uh, the impression that I have is that OS 10 does not look the same way that Mach looked. Um, but I don't know for sure. Hi. Is there any research done by uh, hardware manufacturers to support this kind of an architecture? Like there's some special uh, IPC instruction sets or something like that? Right. So, okay. So um, the, the, the answer, I believe, is generally not um, because I think these are sufficiently... Okay. I'll, I'll answer the question in two parts. Um, does a company like Intel offer features that might be beneficial to microkernels? Not so much. However, there are... There have been sort of dead ends, for lack of a better word, in the hardware space where if you were a vendor that r built hardware but also built the operating system, so like you know, something like Cray or Connection Machine or something like that, then you could well imagine a tighter coupling for this sort of OS architecture. But in terms of anything that we might be running today, um, unfortunately not too much. Um, sorry, I got a little bit lost on the, on the why now section. Uh, like, is the general idea that this work is now relevant because of, like, things like NUMA architectures? Or is it... Uh, yeah, so the, the, way, the way I like to think about the punchline of the paper is that, you know, for decades when we had less, par less parallel, less concurrent machines, um, the price switching to the style of architecture wasn't worth it. But now and possibly in the future, there are, there are, there are sudden new benefits of having this sort of architecture. So NUMA would be an example of one thing that can kind of follow over if you're sharing, if you have too much shared state, that this sort of natural separation gives you. So basically, we're, the, the motivation here is to get rid of this nice abstraction that we've built to cater to the new hardware that is just relevant now? I, I think the argument was, would be is that you have a nicer abstraction that just happens to also fit the new architecture better. And I think you. Okay. Yeah. I was just going to ask a sort of naive question. Of, like you mentioned that the microkernel research has been like sort of the dominant OS research for the past 30 or so years, but it's not what we run. So I guess like 
why don't do they? Is it just they're modeling the kernels not interesting to, from a research perspective, or, or what's the limitation? Why are they still doing it? Why are they still doing it, and why aren't they really? Are are they researching monolithic stuff much? Or so, if there are any microkernel people in the audience, they will gladly tell you that L4 runs on billions of machines because they have some one arrangement with some feature phone operator that like puts them into these like phones that we don't actually ever use. I don't know. Um, so, I mean, I think it remains an interesting research problem because it's still an interesting way of thinking about software and a way of thinking about interactions between hardware. Um, I think. If you are a successful researcher, you always want to believe that there's another stone unturned that may um, that may prove that this thing, the thing that you you think is right, would end up being adopted. Um, that said, microkernel people are very jaded, <laughs> very jaded. You think Haskell people are jaded because no one's using a static type system? <laughs> microkernel people are way worse. All right. So, any more questions? No, nobody in the back. All right. Thank you so much. Thank you very Nathan. much. So we're going to have two minutes and like until like Jordan connects his laptop. If anybody needs to use the restroom or get more things, now is your time. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Do you need anything? Oh, you you can. Do you want me to give you a water or something so you can uh, come here? I have, water? Yeah, I have a water. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, yeah. Yay. Are you alive? No, I'm going to put it down. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Oh, Ryan is here. Hello, Ryan. Yes. All right, so now we're for the main talk. So let's see how I do Jordan's bio. Jordan is a distributed systems practitioner, an open source contributor with a passion for functional programming. He recently worked on the core distributed systems and key value storage components of React. An open source distributed data store implemented major features such as new reliably broadcast protocol <laughs> uh, and replicated metadata store. So Jordan has been busy. Uh, he now spends time working on other distributed systems in, that include uh, Apache Cassandra. When not working on distributed databases or reading papers, you can usually find Jordan now playing with his dogs, which by the way are adorable. Jordan is also employed. So <laughs> let's give it up for Jordan. All right, uh, thanks, Inez, and, and thanks, uh, Yammer, for having us here, and thanks to all of you for, for coming out. Um, so I have to do, like, a brief disclaimer um, to be a bit vague. Uh, so this is an individual contribution. Um, I'm not here representing, like, any employer, past or present. Um, just to be clear, since I'm going to be talking about React and Cassandra, I don't work for Basho, I don't work for Datastacks, and I'm not, like, an Apache member or anything like that. So this is all just me, all right? <laughs> I'm glad I got that out. It was hard to remember all that. It's going to be like the hardest part of the talk. Um, so uh, the topic today is uh, a couple ideas, idea of time and causality. And um, for me, I like to look at how like, so we can take these ideas and put them in a practical setting. So we'll talk about how we use them uh, in distributed systems and specifically in distributed storage. Um, as, as, uh, and as I mentioned, I'd spend some time working on React and Cassandra, which are uh, 
um, similar distributed storage systems in that they give up uh, consistency for availability, um, but they choose to do different things um, with respect to how they sort of talk about events or, or operations in their system. Um, and so we'll look at some of that today and talk about how those ideas are applied. Uh, so I'm going to talk about uh, these two concepts, and I'm going to talk about how they're related and how they're sort of very closely intertwined. And then, like sort of as I mentioned, uh, as I look at papers, I look at them as a practitioner and how I can actually use them in a practical setting. And so we'll, we'll talk about how uh, we take this sort of really abstract uh, concept that you'd wonder about, like, why would anyone make a disclaimer about those things, um, and, and sort of talk about how we apply them practically and sort of all the questions and challenges and going from paper to real implementation. Uh, so we'll do that uh, through uh, three papers that were written over many, many years. Uh, hopefully you've had a chance to read uh, at least the middle one. Uh, the, the return paper does a good job of summarizing the concepts in uh, Leslie Lamport's paper, which is the seminal work on this topic. And uh, it sort of sets the stage for the final paper, which will sort of take us from uh, abstract to, to practical. So the first topic I'm going to talk about is causality. Um, and what causality is, it's the study of events in a system. Uh, it's a really abstract sort of term. And the effects that these events have on each other. Okay, so, so what does that mean? Um, I'm going to be, like, throughout this talk, talking about events with these arbitrary labels. Like, in this case, I'm talking about event A and event B. Um, I might call them something different. But usually, it's going to be A and B. Um, and uh, we're talking about, again, what it means for these events to cause each other, uh, to be not related, and, and then how that tracks back to our, our notion of time. And in order to talk about these things, uh, we, we need the concepts, but we also need some sort of formal way to represent them and talk about them formally. And this is what Lamport's paper, or one of the focuses of Lamport's paper, to give us sort of a formal framework to, to discuss these topics of, of time and causality. So Lamport defines this critical uh, relation, which he calls happens before. And he says that for any two events um, th uh, that are in the same process, that if, you know, it's a single-threaded process, so one event has to happen before the other. There's no parallelism there. We have to execute, you know, the, the store and the memory before the next read from memory. Um, at least in our conceptual model and his conceptual model. And then the other sort of specific point he talks about is uh, that in order to receive a message, there has to be an event that sent it first. Uh, something had to create the message. Messages don't just come out of thin air, um, unless you're, well, sometimes. <laughs> and, uh, but in Lamport's like, non-Byzantine model, the events just don't come out of mid air. And so we, you, the sending of this message has to happen before. And so we can say something about these two events in these very specific contexts um, in terms of time and computing. Um, and then he also goes on to say that, like, hey, events are, are transitive. So we can talk about something. If we know the relationship between two events and another pair of events, we can say something about the relationship of the three events together. So along with happens before, um, Lamport gives us a really nice, uh, succinct definition of concurrency. So a lot of times I think, like, you hear computer scientists debating, like, what is concurrency? What is parallelism? And I think... This definition is a great one to sort of think about concurrency, which is basically to say that if two events don't happen before each other in any way, then they're potentially concurrent, they're, they're, they could be parallel, but in, again, in Lamport's definition, we have this idea now of concurrency, where if they, as long as the A doesn't happen before B, or B doesn't happen before A, we have concurrent events. So this definition gives us, in, in uh, mathematics, what we call an irreflexive partial order, which are three very sort of dense words. So let's sort of break that down from, from right to left. Uh, the idea of order between events is that we can say that one, you know, came before each other in our notion of time, that we can sort of, like, like numbers, we can say that one is less than the other or one is greater than the other. A partial order means that unlike numbers, where every number can be ordered against every other number, there are some events that we can't order against each other, and this is where this idea of concurrency comes in. And then this last sort of uh, modifier, irreflexive, basically means that an event can't happen before itself. Um, so that gives us sort of a, a model of, of our system. And then to tie this back to causality, Lamport says that if A happens before B, then A could have affected B. We don't know that for sure, but we know that's potentially possible. All right, so from causality on to time. Um, <laughs> I've sort of been like mentioning time probably like 20, 30 times already in the first few slides, and I've sort of assumed that as a group we have a common understanding of generally what I mean. Um, but time itself is actually a pretty formally studied notion by many disciplines, uh, physicists and philosophers, and, and our own uh, discipline, computer science. Although, in all honesty, we're a bit behind in, in what we consider the, uh, 
latest and sort of formal understanding compared to these other disciplines, and we'll see how that matters in a moment. Um, but the important part here is that there's sort of several models of time that, that these uh, disciplines have studied, and what model we pick affects sort of our, our notion of time. So in Matern's paper, he actually very clearly lays out, because he understands how important it is when, he's, when discussing this, what the model he's assuming in the paper is, and he calls this the standard model. Uh, and it defines five properties of time. Uh, the first two we've already seen through Lamport's happens before. Um, the idea of linearity basically means that we always move forward at a constant rate in time, if you think of like a linear function. Uh, the idea of eternity means that we do that forever. There's no end to time. And this idea of density, or what he calls five prime discreteness, is that we can basically assign a timestamp to, to any point in time, and at any event or any sort of smaller part of time, we can still give a timestamp. So the integers, the reals, these all sort of fit the standard model. It turns up front with this, though, that the standard model doesn't actually reflect the reality of the world. It's a useful model, and we're going to use it to dis like for the rest of this talk to discuss. But he makes this point that actually there's a model known as Minkowski space-time uh, that is a, a much more accurate reflection of the world. Uh, and I'm not, I don't have a background in physics, so I'm not going to purport to like give you a whole introduction to Minkowski space-time. I'm sure there are people here who know it much better than I do. In fact, I know that Paul Burrill over here will be happy to talk your ear off about it at any time later at the pub. Um, but like, what I want you to take away from, from all of this, instead of like, sort of going into a whole diatribe about it, is that this notion of time and causality are, are very much intertwined. We can't separate them. That they're, they're sort of one and the same. <coughs> so we're all familiar with um, one implementation of time that we all sort of use, which I'll call wall clocks, right? This is like, oh, there's no clock on a, on a wall here. But maybe somebody has a watch on, or you're used to getting the clock from your computer. Yeah, so we have you know, a wall clock up here. I have a wall clock. My computer tells me it's 7.32 and 25 seconds. Um, and these are, are, are useful in certain ways, but because of some of the problems that we're about to talk about, uh, they pose some challenges for distributed systems. Uh, I do want to clarify that that doesn't mean that, like, there are very successful systems that are built using wall clocks. Um, people know that Cassandra has been used widely. Um, but when you choose to use wall clocks, you make very specific trade-offs about um, accurately tracking events in the system under certain conditions. And so you need to be aware of that. OK, so the problems with, with this idea of physical time, um, there, are, there are three major ones in my mind. Uh, the first is, how do we actually set the time? So how did the, the clock on the wall actually get set to this time? How did my computer know it was 7.33? What is, where did it get that from? Um, Additionally, the way that we sort of keep time, that we move it forward in this linear fashion, as, as Matern talks about, that we expect is through some timing me mechanism like your CPU clock. Uh, and those are, those are imperfect. We can't perfectly keep time with them. Um, and then since they're imperfect, that means that our computers aren't actually exactly synchronized with each other. So if we're talking about milliseconds, we actually can't guarantee that machine A and machine B have the exact idea of the current time to the exact milliseconds. Uh, and that problem is extremely difficult. So while we have things like NTP, or more recently famous as Google Spanner, they don't give us a perfect picture of time, even if you attach atomic clocks to your servers in your data center for millions and millions of probably dollars. I don't actually know how much that costs, but I can't imagine it's cheap. <laughs> so what do these problems sort of mean practically? Um, well, inside of these drift bounds, if we have a seven millisecond drift and we update, say, the same key in a database within those seven milliseconds, we can't actually accurately reflect um, the, 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 the order of events that occurred. We, it just breaks down. And this is the idea, again, of that time is a partial ordering of events, as Lamport said, and, and wall clock or physical time is a, is a total ordering. Um, additionally, and this is going to be sort of an important theme throughout this talk, this idea of monotonicity or something that is always either increasing or always decreasing but sort of going in the same direction, um, is that the clocks that we use in our computers either don't guarantee monotonicity or they guarantee it by being wrong. Um, those are basically the two choices you get. Um, and that's because of some really interesting properties of time uh, that, you know, for example, like things like leap seconds. So 
this notion of logical time that Lamport talks about is a way to accurately sort of reflect our notion of time without the inaccuracies of the timing mechanism. And so he does this by de defining some formalisms. The first one is the clock function, which, like any mathematical function, has a domain and a range. And so basically, we plug events into this function, and it says, ah, this is the timestamp for this event. Um, but it's important to note that like, this notion of timestamp is, is, is very abstract here. It's not a, a wall clock timestamp. It's, in, in it's, it's anything right now um, by, by the definition we have so far. So it doesn't guarantee a timing mechanism. Um, but Lamport does go on to put some further restrictions on this clock function by saying it must meet the clock condition. And so the clock condition um, is essentially a restriction on how the function must act. And it, it's basically, you know, if, if two events, if one happens before the other, the timestamp of the first event has to be smaller than the timestamp of the second event. Um, so really quick, before I talk about some of these rules, let me just sort of uh, discuss the notation here, because there's a little bit of a um, ambiguity. So Lamport talks about sort of a clock function and its parts. The, the big C with no subscripting in the first bullet point is the, the sort of the global clock function over all of the processes. And the, the subscripted clock function is like at process I, which is one of the processes in your system, this is what it thinks the clock is. Um, and so this is only important just to sort of understand that, uh, for example, when A happens before B in the same process, we're not looking at the global clock function being less than the global clock function of the second event. We're looking at the local clock. Um, he goes on to formalize that uh, about the sending of messages. And again, this is sound pretty familiar with the uh, happens before relationship, but now we're talking about the clock. Um, but, and then one sort of important distinction that Lamport makes is that we can only say things about the timestamps from the ordering of the events. Just because one timestamp is smaller than the other doesn't mean that that, that smaller timestamps event happened before the other. We can't do that with Lamport clocks. And so since I kind of just let the cat out of the bear early, Lamport clocks are Leslie Lamport's implementation of the clock condition, the clock function. So it's, it's important to separate this abstract formalism from the actual implementation. So we're going to talk about three different implementations through three different papers. That doesn't fall. Um, so for the timestamps, Lamport chooses the set of integers. So we're going to plug events into our clock function, and Lamport's implementation of the clock function is going to give us back an integer that says this is the timestamp. It's one integer. So uh, he goes on to define some rules, which, again, are hopefully starting to sound like, like there's a familiar pattern going on here. Um, but each process has its own local clock. You can think about that like a variable or as a counter. Um, and it increments it when it performs an event within the process, and it includes it when it sends a message. And the other part is that when you receive a message, you update your clock by using the following rule, where you basically take the pairwise max of the message and your clock, and you add one to it. All right, so let's look at that visually um, instead of just in words, because it's kind of dense. So in our first process, uh, we, we perform an event, and we update our clock. Another process performs an event, and it does our clock. And again, this is, these are independent, so we didn't like increment to two. This isn't a, a, a globally sort of... We don't have any coordination about these clocks. It's each done within the process with local knowledge. When we send a message, we take the maximum. So the maximum of one and one is one. We add one to it, and the clock becomes two. So that's the second event in that process. We can have independent events that still continue to move the you know, second clock forward. And this third clock, which you know, was at zero, can receive a message, and it will move its clock forward. And so that's how the, the Lamport clock implementation works um, sort of over time. Um, is everyone familiar with like, the, the time diagrams here? OK, cool, because I had a note to explain that, and I didn't. So um, so those are Lamport clocks. That's cool. We found a way to represent our notion of time um, and how to talk about events that happen before each other uh, without a timing mechanism. But there are some problems, and this is one of the things that Matern sort of is aiming to solve. He, he outlines it and then and solves it in his paper. Uh, and what it is is that the, the two sets, the sets of events and the set of integers, aren't similar in structure uh, or what we call isomorphic. They're, they're close, but they're not identical. Um, so this is really nicely visualized in section, section 6 of the paper, um, where we look at this concurrent function, and we see that in the set of integers, uh, it maps to three operations. And if it was isomorphic, we'd see three lines, an exact one-to-one -one relationship. Um, and the the... the cause of this problem is if we think about the set of events which we've said are partially ordered, 
and we think about the integers, which we know are totally ordered, just in that statement alone, we can see that there's a structural inequality between the two sets. Um, and so one of my colleagues, again, Paul, uh, when he was discussing this subject with me, um, pointed out a, a sort of an a thing that I thought was really important about this, which is that Lamport recognized that where events happen, and sort of if you think now back to this idea of space, time, and Minkowski, um, but that where events happen were important, um, not, not just when, uh, but it was not until Matern that that information was actually carried along in the clock. So Lamport clocks don't say anything about where the event happened, they're just a number. Um, but as we'll see, we move thrower, forward, uh, Matern's clocks actually carry along that information, which helps us regain our structure. Uh, and so again, this has some sort of profound effects on the, the usage of these. Um, and so Lamport, you know, again, and Matern both address these points. Um, and this is not to say that Lamport's clocks are wrong. Like, this is a seminal, very highly regarded paper. It would be wrong of me to say that, like, oh, there's this problem, and therefore Lamport clocks are useless. It's just that the problems he was trying to solve, they were good enough for. But as we start looking at things like distributed storage and distributed debugging, which Matern was, uh, the, that loss of structure becomes problematic. So Matern, again, aims to solve this through what he calls vector time. Um, and that's how we get sort of this structure back. Um, and he sort of explains, at least in my mind, he explains sort of his, his thought process of how he arrived at this um, by saying, imagine that we were some supernatural person, observer, that could instantly get every clock from every machine and perfectly know what the time was on every single one. That would be really awesome. Then he breaks our heart and tells us that we can't. But he goes on to say, if we had an approximation of it, if that approximation was as good as it can be, maybe it would be good enough for us to use. And one way that we could represent that is we could, instead of having a single clock, a single integer, we could have a vector of integers where each integer represents the clock of one process in the system. <coughs> so again, Matern takes this, this abstract concept and he implements the clock function and the clock condition. So instead of the set of integers now, we have the set of vectors. Um, and again, there are a set of rules that hopefully this pattern, again, is starting to sound pretty familiar. Uh, the difference here is that, for example, when we receive a message, we take the pairwise maximum of every element and then increment our element in the clock. Um, and we only ever update our element in the clock. The others are uh, for, uh, for the other processes to update. And what's interesting about this is that we start to learn about the system as we progress, and we'll see that visually. So once again, a similar time diagram, but in this case now we have a vector where each entry represents you know, the, the line, um, the, the process itself. So the first event in this process increments that, that process's clock. Same in the second process. When we send a message, again, we, we do this pairwise maximum. So we would have um, you know, the maximum of one and one, and, or one and zero, zero and one, and then we increment our clock, so we get uh, the, the version vector that just appeared there. Again, we can have independent events, and so this is basically the exact same diagram, but with, with vector time. Um, and so we can see how this would occur as we send the, the final message, um, how sort of these vector clocks progress and, and, and update themselves. All right, so Matern implements the clock condition here, or in the clock function, and he gives us something useful, but he also gives us sort of three um, other other functions that, that closely relate that let us do useful things with, with vector clocks. And this is uh, important for when we start talking about how we apply these practically. Um, so these first two are basically the, the less than or less than or equal to relationship. Basically the difference is, is, is the not equal to part. Everything else is the same. Uh, the point is you do pairwise comparisons. Um, and again, Matern gives us this idea of concurrent, which basically says if one, if, if the vectors don't dominate each other, one doesn't dominate the other, then they're concurrent. So getting like really into the like math, math, um, the, this, these vectors and, and the, well, it says dominates here, but that's actually wrong because I had a, a typo early and I guess I didn't change that part. Um, but the vectors and, and these functions um, that I'm going to talk about in a moment form what we call a lattice mathematically. And so a lattice is a specific mathematical structure. It's a partially ordered set. Hopefully that's starting to sound familiar. Um, and that has 
uh, two operations on it, the least upper bound and the greatest lower bound. And basically to implement those, we just use the pairwise maximum, which that gives us the greatest upper bound on two vectors, and the pairwise minimum gives us the greatest lower bound on two vectors, or the smaller of the two, so to speak. Um, and so this lattice actually regains our structure. So the, the events in the distributed system are themselves that, something that looks like a lattice, and we can represent them with vector time. And now we can make um, very succinct statements about the relationship between events and the relationship of their clocks. So we can say that if and only if the clock of one event is less than the clock of the other event, then one happens before the other. And that's something we couldn't do with Lamport's clocks before. And so Matern goes through a series of sort of formalizations, but the most interesting one is this theorem 10. All right. So now let's talk about how like, we actually apply this. Um, so we have a few different concepts of logical time. How are they used in practice today? Uh, so so Lamport clocks, um, again, because of the limitations, there are certain things like in the systems that I'm used to working on where they don't really apply. Um, however, you see sort of versions of them in, uh, for example, consensus systems and different gossip implementations. Um, and they're sort of useful for, for uh, as portions of a larger distributed algorithm. Um, but again, for our purpose of distributed storage, they have some limitations. Like we can't really detect um, concurrent updates based on the timestamp. Like we can look at two data items and maybe say something about, or a trace and say something about their clocks. But again, we need Matern's ability to say uh, from something about the clocks, something about the data items and their relationship. And it also, um, when you have a system like this that allows concurrent writes and, and has a sort of loose coordination when it comes to updates, uh, deleting data is very difficult. And with Lamport clocks, it's even more so. So vector time um, and Matern's idea was made popular by a paper uh, out of Amazon called the Dynamo paper. Uh, I hope most people here are probably aware that that's not Amazon's DynamoDB. Uh, this was many years before. Um, and it was the influence for paper uh, for systems like Vasho's Rioc, Apache's Cassandra, LinkedIn's Voldemort, and many other systems. Um, it made it popular, but it certainly wasn't the first to talk about it. Actually, five years before Matern, uh, there was a rather prescient paper uh, by Parker et al. that not only talks about the use of version vectors in the building of an eventually consistent distributed file system, but also really discusses something that looks like the CAP theorem early on in a non-formal sense, and uh, the CRDTs are like the sort of uh, safe, eventually consistent sets that we're used to today. And so it talks about these things, again, five years before Matern was formalizing it, and what now, 30, over 30 years ago? Um, so that's really cool, because we're, we're still talking about that today, and we're still learning a lot about it, and, and they were very, had a lot of foresight. Um, but the similarity between these two papers is that each replica, each data item is sort of paired with this vector, so this piece of metadata that, that talks about its versioning. Um, and in the case of the Dynamo paper, each client process had an entry in that vector. And when a client updates uh, an, a data item, it updates its entry in the vector. It increments it. It moves it forward. All right, so a brief detour. Um, I lied. There are more interesting papers on this subject. Uh, hopefully, these will like, interest you to go read some of them. Um, so the size of this vector is something that, as a practitioner, we may think about, right? Like, if I have a small amount of data, and I have this large vector that really is a lot of waste of precious space that I have when I'm building a system like this. And so we'd like to know what our sort of worst case bounds are. And so there's a paper that at first a lot of people thought sort of applied, um, and it's concerning this, the size of logical clocks in a distributed system, and it's by a woman named Bernadette Sharon Bost. I probably am butchering her name. Um, but her result says that the smallest vector we can have must include an entry for every process that has ever been in the system. Uh, if not, you can't accurately track causality. So if you think about, for example, the number of clients in your, what you might call it, cloud environment where your nodes are going up all and down in your web scale, like that's, you know, maybe hundreds of thousands of clients and that vector's getting really, really big. Um, you don't just store the integer, you need to store the identifier. Um, so it isn't just like, oh, let me pack a bunch of integers into an array. Um, but there's hope. As I said, like we thought that this applied, but um, our, one, of the, 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 one of the authors of our final paper, uh, Carlos Baccaro, um, actually wrote a great blog post where he outlines why the Char and Bose doesn't reply to distributed storage. Um, and 
the point is that there are actually two concepts or two ideas of vector time that are applied in practice. There are version vectors, which is actually what we use, despite what anybody else would have called it previously. You may have heard like uh, React engineers say that we use vector clocks. Um, React engineers have since said, wait, no, we use version vectors. We're sorry. Um, and so, but the, the distinction is about what we're establishing this partial order over. We're not establishing over all the events in the system, over all processes. We're establishing update, a partial over updates to a given replica. And that means that our version vectors aren't necessarily subject to char and boast because, again, the char and boast result specifically applies to the first one. That doesn't mean that someone won't come around and make a proof like making of all cry later, but char and boast proof doesn't apply. All right, so again, like I said, in distributed storage, we typically use version vectors, not vector clocks. Um, so if you were going to implement these in practice, there's a lot of questions you have to ask yourself going from Matern's paper to the real world. Um, so some of those, for example, that we sort of alluded to already is like, what are the entries in the vector clock? What do they represent? Are they unique clients? Are they the replicas? Um, and we have to get even more granular than that. Like, what happens if we have multiple clients in, in a multi-threaded application in a single process? Are each of them uh, a unique actor? Um, and all these decisions have practical sort of um, effects on, on the system that you build. So the client-side vector clocks have, have some advantages in that um, if built correctly, they are completely accurate. They track um, entire, entirely accurately the causality of the system, uh, of the updates in the system. Um, and they come with this other nice property that the updates are item potent. So since the client is controlling the clock, not the server, it can kind of resend the update with the same clock if it's failed. And because of this happens before relationship between our clocks, we can say, oh, I've already seen this update. I don't need it anymore. Um, and this is a, uh, in very useful, for example, in React's uh, gossip implementation, um, the, uh, which doesn't use client-side version vectors but takes advantage of this sort of same idea. Um, the problems are is that we are actually, in this case, subject to char and boast. We are actually tracking every client or every process in the system that is affecting updates or performing like a very specific subset of events. And so again, our version vectors can get huge, um, the cloud. And uh, so in production, like Amazon talked about for Dynamo, that they actually like chopped off parts of the version vector, what they called pruning. Um, but to do this correct hasn't necessarily been proven. It's certainly um, dangerous in that you can introduce false concurrency, you can mess up things. So like, you can think like, oh, well, maybe there are certain um, you know, actor IDs that can clean up because I'll know they'll never come back. But how do you know they're really gone? So um, you, have, you have some problems with the idea of pruning. And then again, I mentioned that for this accuracy, you have to implement things correctly. Um, and this is something that uh, the React engineers noticed uh, much later after React and, and Dynamo already had this, which is to actually be correct about this, you need read your own writes. And that if I write a new clock, my next read better see that new clock or I'm going to generate a lot of false concurrency, or depending on the implementation, I may have data loss. Um, in the case of uh, REAC, you would get a lot of this false concurrency or sort of like si uh, sibling replica data that, that shouldn't be, that like if you thought about it logically in your head, it's like this update followed this one, why is that data still there? Um, and I can't actually speak to what Dynamo did, but I'm assuming they didn't want to lose data. So you kind of have one choice. So I said that was going to fall at some point, didn't I? Um, so the, uh, another alternative is instead of every client having an entry, we have something like every node in the cluster having an entry or every replica, every process that updates a replica having an entry. And so obviously the, we have order of magnitude smaller clients. That our clusters are, are much smaller than the number of clients that typically talk to them and even more so the number of replicas that we have compared to the number of clients. Um, but as we'll see, which will bring us to our third paper, which addresses these problems, um, we can get this false concurrency or, or, or data loss again. So it depends on the implementation, and, and we'll talk a bit about that. Um, but we can either think we have concurrent updates that are, in fact, not concurrent, or we can throw away updates that we, in fact, shouldn't have thrown away. Um, one other lim limitation of this is that since the replica, let's say you choose the replica as the uh, identifier, the replica has to be the one that performs the update because we can't update the clock of somebody else's process. That's one of the rules of, of the vector clock, right? All right, so starting to talk about these problems. Um, this is how we're starting to get into the third paper now, which unfortunately we only have so much time to go into, so I'm going to sort of lay the stage for um, how we do this practically and then sort of hopefully get you guys interested enough to read about uh, some of the other papers by these authors. So 
the problem is that what is what they refer to as a downward closed set, um, which needs some explanation. Uh, if we think of the vector clock, if we say like you know entry A has counter two, then we know that on A we've seen event two, the event one, and the event zero because of the nature of the clock. And if entry B has seen um, counter one, we know we've seen the event one and zero on B. We can't say anything though about like event five with a version vector without saying that we've seen four. So this is the idea of a downward closed set or a contiguous set of events. And so they go on to say that it's actually not enough to identify concurrent versions when several clients perform a, like a read of one key from a server and they both then they both perform put, but they use the same causal pass. So they use the same vector clock when they perform the update. And so there's there's a problem here. And it's again because we lose structure by moving our client IDs from the server or from the client to the server. Um, and so if we look here, we have two clients that are on the top, the first two lines performing updates. Uh, and so this sort of notation is the value and then the squiggly line and then the vector clock that it's being, or the version vector rather that's being updated with. I still make that mistake. Um, so the two clients both uh, write values V1 and the other one writes V2 and they write them with the empty vector clock. So they saw, they, they read maybe before and they got nothing. Um, and so the first update gets assigned the vector clock A1. And now this is where we get to choose between data loss and concurrency. And we'll see how that plays out more in a second. So now the vector clock of V2 happened before the vector clock of V1. And we know this by doing the pairwise comparison. So we can say, well, V2 must be older. We don't need to see it. That would be data loss. Or we can keep V2. We can generate, we can merge the two vector clocks and update it, which gives us the new vector clock of A2. While all that was going on, that first process again reads with the original vector clock, and it says, I want to update from V1 to V3. So we have this causal relationship now where V3 causally follows V1. We, go, we write that, and again, we have the same problem of the vector clock on disk is A2. It happened after the vector clock A1. Do we keep V3 or do we throw it away? Again, throwing it away is data loss. We can keep it. But we have nothing to say about what we can do with the other values. And so to be safe, we keep all of them. And so if you were to repeat this process over and over and over again, your set of siblings here, V1, V2, V3, and let's say we went to like V10, would all end up there. And this is what we call in React sibling explosion. And basically, um, unless you can stop the concurrent updates at this point to actually like write one new uh, replica, this is going to keep going and going and going and going and going. And um, at some point, most of these distributed storage systems have an upper limit on like a practical object size. The siblings sort of count into that and things go boom. So again, this, solving this problem is, is the goal of our final paper. So what uh, the authors basically state is that if we can track not only this downward closed set of events, but also a unique event, so that if we have two concurrent events, we can identify them uniquely. One will be contiguous, one will not. Um, if we can represent that, then maybe we can get things right. So it's, again, helpful to look at these things visually. The authors give us a nice visualization. Um, the first is what they call a causal history, which is basically just a set of event labels. And uh, we can say here um, that we can represent any, you know, like B1 and B2 are contiguous, but C4 is completely not contiguous. I could have A10 in my, in my causal history also. And this is the most accurate way we can track updates. Uh, however, if we thought the vector was too big, carrying around a set of event identifiers for all of time is certainly not practical. Um, so we won't be doing that. The, the middle picture is the version vector. Um, and so again, we can represent this downward closed set or this contiguous, like all the boxes are touching. Um, and then what we have this, the concept that we're introducing, which is the dot version vector, which again, we get the, the version vector itself and then what we call the dot, which is another event which may or may not be contiguous. So that's not to say that like if we had C3 instead of C4, this wouldn't be a valid dotted version vector. So it can or cannot be contiguous. So the dot formally is just an identifier, like the identifier you keep in the version vector and an integer. Um, and this helps us globally uh, identify this event uniquely. Um, but, uh, and so together what we have is now the dot and the version vector as a pair, and that's our logical clock. And so with this, we can add, like, solve the problems of using the server-side version vectors. So we have something that is efficient in size and accurate.
So uh, there's a lot in the paper that, I, that I'm not going to be able to go into in terms of the different operations they define. Um, but the one that's uh, important in terms of seeing how it solves our specific problem is uh, th this property that b between two dotted version vectors that we can look at the dot, and if the dot is contained in the causal history or the version vector of the other uh, dotted version vector, then we know that the entire causal history is actually contained within that version vector. Um, and so we can use that when we're performing updates. So again, this is the same diagram, but in this case, we're using dotted version vectors. So now in the uh, bottom uh, and the replica, we have sort of the, uh, the array in square brackets, which will be our version vector, and then the pair on the outside is the, is the dot. So when we write the first value, we just generate the dot A1, which is the un unique event, the first event at, at this node, and we keep an empty version vector. So now when we get the conflicting one, um, which is less than the dot, we say, okay, we're not going to throw it away. We're, we are going to keep a sibling, and we'll give it a new dot. So now instead of having two siblings and just one version vector with A2, we have two siblings with two dotted version vectors, each of which has, has a unique dot and the empty version vector. When we go to do our causal write from V1 to V3, now we can actually drop any... Uh, any value that has a dot or causal history that the dot subsumes. So in this case, V1 has the dot A1, um, and the new value was written with the causal past of A1, so we know we can, we can discard that. So we keep V2 because that's not true for V2, and V3 is our new value, so we generate a new dot for it, and we do that by taking the maximum of all the values here, which is 2, and adding 1 to it, so we get A3. Um, and so we keep V2 and V3, and these are the correct siblings that we, um, that we actually expected. And so uh, React uh, engineers have actually seen in production that moving from the old scheme to this scheme actually stopped sibling explosion in its tracks. So we have, again, now an accurate and concise way to represent um, this causal history without any timing mechanism. All right, so getting near the end here, um, I got to make a small admission because I just said, like, oh, React saw this problem solved. Um, they did, but the implementation that React uses isn't exactly what I talked about or what's talked about in that paper because it turns out that there's a more efficient way to represent the clocks that we were talking about than dotted version vectors. And so the same authors wrote a follow-up paper, which is uh, where they define a concept called the dotted version vector set. Um, and the DVV set is essentially a more compact way of representing these. If this topic has interested you at all, then I suggest going to read that paper. Um, it's... A very interesting read. All right, so to sort of review what we've talked about, because I've talked about a lot, um, hopefully you've sort of seen some of the value in this idea of logical time and, and why we might explore it. Um, we've talked sort of about the notions of time and causality and how deeply related they are, um, and that events that happen earlier in our notion of time may or may not have some effect on future events. And so we looked at uh, Lamport's sort of formalization of this idea, specifically the clock function and the condition. Um, and we looked at three implementations, the last one of which gives us an efficient way to talk about time in a distributed storage system like Basho's REAC that uh, loosely coordinates or doesn't use consensus. And so I think one of the important sort of takeaways here is um, implementing consensus is, is very, very hard, but using it is actually very, very convenient. Um, and the, the working around it, uh, trying to find ways to not coordinate, like using logical time, is, is a very difficult challenge. Um, and sort of one final takeaway that I think is really important is this assumption and con like sort of theme that's been trailing in the background of this talk was the idea of we assume that time always moves forward. Um, so when we talked about the version vectors, I said that, to, or the client side version vectors, I said to implement them correctly, you have to read your own rights. You have to, if you picture the lattice as kind of a ladder, you can move up, you can go sideways, but you better not go back downwards. Um, you always have to move forward. And this assumption has a lot of practical, uh, like the real world and this assumption don't always jive. Um, and so there's a, if, if you're familiar with the React community at all, there's a bug known as React KV679, which basically talks about all the ways that you can lose data because monotonicity has been assumed and you don't actually get it. Um, one of those is, like, it turns out deleting data in one of these systems is really, really hard because when your clock goes away, like when you physically remove the clock from the disk, then you've gone back in time. You're back at zero, and you've just violated monotonicity. Um, some things also like happen when you try to do backup or restore and other weird things like that. 
Um, so again, this idea of monotonicity is one that we assume as as a, as a discipline, I guess, but it has some some perils, and so to keep that in mind. And so with that, thanks again for listening, and I'll take any questions if there are some. All right, what's the question? Everybody shy today. Yeah. Um, can you go back to like the last diagram? Yeah. Oh. So like, um, basically here, do you in a in a practical sense, do you force the clients to have read at some point before they do a put because you have essentially exploding if they just like put it, then you're totally bummed. Yeah, um, so that's one of the, like, you know, everything that we do is trade-offs, right? So one of the, one of the trade-offs that we have to make for this is that you have to read before you write. You have to get um, a notion of the time you've seen before you can update. Or, yes, like, you're just going to generate siblings. So people like in React actually didn't, users of React didn't notice this at first and just shoved a bunch of data in and then ended up with all the siblings. Do you enforce that in React, or do you just sort of like assume the clients have to do the right thing? Um, no, yeah, the client, like the client libraries, are the ones that tend to enforce that. We let you sh shoot yourself in the foot. So like people playing with curl tend to <laughs> shoot themselves in the foot. Um, this is also like where like the like because again this decision of like the vector clock that um, happens before the one on disk, we save the replica. Like yeah, there are people who actually built systems assuming that that happened and so like they generated a bunch of siblings and then tried to read and yeah that like they were trying to get around this read before everything but you just can't give it up um there is hope uh the the crdt work that was done in react um essentially allows you when you're adding information so if you're adding to a set incrementing a counter or adding to a map you can do that without reading the map first it's only to remove data that you have to read before you write now Hi, my question is, is it technically possible to add dotted version vector sets to Cassandra? <laughs> is it technically possible? Wait, I, can you say first what Cassandra, the Cassandra situation looks like? Yeah, okay, so um, Cassandra does not use, it uses physical time, not logical time. Um, and so basically every uh, write or every column that you update is included with a timestamp. And when you have two columns that conflict, you compare timestamps first. Um, and so it doesn't maintain siblings. Um, is that yeah. a good summary? Um, so Paul was just asking, like, if we wanted to add dotted version vectors to it. Um, because of the use of physical time, Cassandra makes a lot of assumptions about what it can do. For example, it doesn't have to read before you write, which is why Cassandra is much better performing than React in, in the common case. Um, so yes, we could add it, um, but we like you'd be making trade-offs about you know get the some of the things that you gain in Cassandra from making this time assumption you you lose to get the the accuracy. Um, so two questions, and the most they're both kind of like I think uh, kind of dumb. Um, so in a system like Cassandra that has like um, a wall clock time, if you could like guarantee like uh, that the drift is not going to be above or beyond certain something, uh, could you use one of those um, a vector clock or one of those systems and you know guarantee that it's not going to um, expand too much if you only work within that wall clock time? And the second is how, what. What's a sibling? Like, what's happening there? Are you updating a value, or is it a single value, or is that a, a list? All right, so uh, let me answer the first question first, actually, about what is a sibling. Um, sorry, because I kind of assumed. Uh, but so in, in React, unlike uh, Cassandra, when we have two concurrent writes, um, like, let's say, you know, like in this case, right, this, uh, this V3 and this V2, while they may not happen in parallel, they're concurrent in the sense that there's no causal relation between them. Um, the uh, in React we keep both. We don't know what the correct answer is, so we say here's both application. You decide in some way how to resolve that. And then there's a set of research called CRDTs, which are um, about not making the application make those decisions, but letting the server make those decisions. And so they're kind of like data structures that you'd be familiar with. And then um, so for your second question about like I guess about 
clock drift, and if we had like a known bound on it, can we do some interesting things there? Um, yeah, like so for example, I think you know an, an interesting point to make out is if you're updating events like really slowly and you're not doing or updating like a key like very you know disparately in time and you're not doing things like accidentally changing your computer's time zone from you know UTC to Pacific, which happens by the way. Um, the uh, like if if you're outside of this drift and you can somehow guarantee that you're always outside of this drift, you're safe. Um, it just turns out that guaranteeing you're always inside of this drift is really, really hard. And so you hear in practice, you know, sometimes milliseconds of drift and sometimes minutes of drift. Um, and also you see things like operators, again, like accidentally having one node configured to Pacific time and the rest to UTC and, and, and funny things happen. Um, does that answer your question? Or there's, I guess there was the bit about the vector clock also, right? Yeah, so could you, like, I think that uh, while I don't have a good answer for you, I think that's actually a very interesting, like, point of future research of like, could we recognize that we're in this drift bound somehow and use a vector clock within that bound in order to sort of keep things sane um, and sort of like say, oh no, I can't affect this right for you, but maybe if you use a vector clock, it can. Um, I think those are very vague ideas in my head, but I think they're really interesting ones as we look at sort of the future of distributed storage. I'd hope that we see some research on it. Something along the same lines as what he asked. Um, so many kernels provide something called monotonic time. Uh, can that help in uh, implementing parts of the systems? Um, and so, uh, and if, if you're aware, how is that implemented? Does it work if you take off the clock from the machine? Uh, yeah, so we have, so for example, um, you're talking about like uh, that there are certain... Um, monotonic clocks that like the kernel gives us. Is that what you're referring to? Um, so there are different ones. So for example, there are monotonic clocks that don't give us a very interesting notion of time across even cores. So like, um, like system.nano time in Java guarantees you monotonicity, but you're actually not guaranteed that across cores, at least on certain kernels. Um, so there are some, but again, this is like, that's why I, th I was saying that monotonicity is such an important concept because like we want it, it makes things easy but we have to either give up accuracy or we don't get it. So like I can give you monotonic clock, but the time may be wrong. Um, and so in uh, Cassandra, for example, there are some places in the code where they're like, oh, I've generated this timestamp, so I'll give the timestamp like plus one. Um, and that can lead to like, again, you uh, an event that actually happened concurrently now looks like it happened after something. Um, so we have them, but they're imperfect. Has any system tried to use that? Or like you said, it's not, it still doesn't guarantee against scores, so people don't try to use it. Yeah, um, I think there are systems that have assumed it, whether that's on purpose or not, but I don't know many that have, like, like in, in React, like for certain things, like actually for the actor IDs, we use what, uh, Erlang's guaranteed monotonic clock um, because we always want a clock that moves forward. Um, but for tracking just like the actual data storage items, uh, no, most of them use, you know, like get current time millis or something, which isn't guaranteed to be monotonic. More questions? Any, anybody? You can always talk more at the bar. The bar, yeah. Well, I guess we're going to call it maybe once, twice, nope. All right, so. Thank you, everybody, for coming. I guess I'll see you next month. I forgot that one of our mini speakers is over there. So, Clark, uh, thank you again uh, to Yammer for hosting us, and we'll see you at the bar.